So hi, Robert. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. You are a licensed clinical social worker and you've authored, what, 13 books, over 300 articles. You're like one of the top 100 therapists. You're like a muckety muck in the therapy world. Yeah, that's what happens when you get to live a long time. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's because you have a lot of talent. You have a lot of important things to share. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you were willing to spend some time with us. I think one of the things that I think you really describe well and talk about well is this need for family therapy and and why we would go to family therapy. So can you talk about what it is from your perspective and why it's important? Sure, sure. Uh, You know, a good good part of my work is couples therapy, you know, as well. And, you know, why do couples go to couples therapy? Well, because they have problems in their relationship, they can't communicate, they're not solving problems. Family therapy is just an extension of that. You know, oftentimes, sometimes it's about, you know, I saw a family even just yesterday where it's a teenager, you know, they're struggling with their dad, they get into arguments, mom feels caught in the middle, you know, can't figure out how to how to help them to calm down and work out problems. And so they needed a safe place to talk it through. You know, they needed a safe place to kind of talk about how they each felt. And, you know, the advantage of, of therapy is always the person, you know, the therapist there is the outsider, you know, and, you know, one of, one of, one of the things I can do is ask the hard questions, mm. you know, and try, and we're always looking for what's the problem under the problem. Right. You know, I'm yeah. always telling folks, where do you guys get stuck solving your own problems? And just as it is with couples, the same thing can happen with families. You know, communication breaks down, somebody gets angry. Everybody gets emotional and then they have a hard time making up and circling back and solving problems. A lot of times that's about skills. You know, I think one of the real benefits of of therapy for a lot of folks is you can learn skill. You you know, you're not going to be born to know how to, you know, be the perfect communicator, you know, because we're human and we're not robots and whatever. And so having somebody there to both moderate the conversation, but also help you learn how to communicate better so you're heard or helping, because I come from a systems model, I'm always trying to help families see where they start to get stuck. Mm. You know, because all right, right, guys. System, right? As, as yeah. we come together as a family and we figure out or not figure out who are we as a couple, and then we relay that on to our children, we've created unintentionally a system. Absolutely. Yeah. And part of systems is it's easy to get into patterns. You know, it's about how people bounce off of each other. It's not about who's who's the one who screwed up. You know, so w- one of my jobs is to help families realize, you know, the metaphor I use for communication is, you know, it's like driving a car and you, you got to gotta keep the car on the road. You know, and, and the skill set here is to be able to realize we're not getting anywhere to realize that your teenage son is shutting down and not even hearing you and getting defensive or realize we're going around and around in the same loop and nobody's hearing anybody. And can we self-correct? It's kind of like the car's going off the road. Yeah, we got to, we got to learn how to do that. You know, my goal is to help them learn to do that so they don't have to keep coming to me, you know, so they can learn to solve their own problems so they can communicate better and be heard. And, you know, oftentimes, It doesn't have to be long term. It doesn't have to be extensive. I think a lot of folks get scared about the notion of family therapy because they're they they're worried they're never going to come out of it. You know, Mm, we're going to that we're we're in here until the kid graduates from college and has their own house. Right, right, and it doesn't have to be that way. You know, a lot of times it is about you know just having a place to air things out, begin to come up with some kind of solutions to problems that everybody can agree on. And also just learn some basic skills. And, you know, and oftentimes that's enough just to kind of give get people a new start. And, you know, a lot of times that, that's fine. If they need to come back later on because of a new problem, that's absolutely fine. Do you find that sometimes, because this is something we talk about in therapy and I want to make it not so f- therapy heavy, but sometimes we get invested in making one family member sort of the one that represents all of the problems because that lets us 
divert from dealing with our problems as the parents, right? right. That we get entrenched in like junior is the problem. Junior being a teenager is yeah. the reason that everything is happening because talking about our stuff, we either don't have the tools like you said, or that's just yeah. too scary. So we can be united finally in something about dealing with junior. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, the old, the old school theories about family therapy were, you know, a lot of times, particularly if you're having parenting problems, sometimes that's about skills. You know, we, you know, there's a, you know, you've met them, I've met them, you know, parents who do great with eight year olds, but when the kid is 14 years old, they're struggling because they're trying to handle the child the same way they did when they were eight years old, picking them up and putting them in his room. Now they can't pick him up because he's 200 pounds and he won't go in his room, you know, and it's, they need to kind of adapt, but you're right. You know, it's a lot of times it is about parents, you know, the child becomes the focus. And, and a lot of times the child, you know, the old school idea is that a lot of times the child becomes a focus and what's underneath it are marital problems. Mm. And we don't know how to deal with our marital problems, but we do feel close and connected when we're talking about this problem. Or, or yes, or or we we kind of fight our marital problems through the the you know the child. Ah, so you that know, the angry are... fourteen year old, you know, who's yelling at mom or yelling at dad, is sort of vicariously kind of saying what mom or dad ain't saying. You know, they go, go talk to your father. If you don't like what he's saying, go tell him how you feel. Mm, I'm not oh, doing that, of good, course, but, but I, I want you to. Right, right. And, uh, you know, and, you know, one of the things I've done, and I, I tend to do now in the in the in the last years is that, you know, rather than even seeing a whole family together for an initial visit, I'll see the parents because I want to see if they're on the same page. Mm, okay. You what know, kind of things are not, you? They're not on the same page. What's going to happen is they're going to be arguing and disagreeing, oftentimes in front of the kid about how to parent, and the kid can hear that. But also, the kid kind of learns to, you know, kind of work the system, not not intentionally, not maliciously. But I'm going to go talk to dad about whether I can stay out late because mom's going to give me a hard time, you know. And and the parents need to work together. The parents need to be on the same page. They need to have an agreement, even though their styles are different. You know, one person may be more abrupt, maybe more whatever, but whatever. But they got to agree about bottom lines. You know, how important is schoolwork? How about homework? How about I'll let you stay out? We need to agree about this kind of stuff or else the kids get confused. Even young kids, you know, kids, kids who don't have enough structure and don't know what the rules and routines are tend to be anxious kids yeah you know, one of the things that really helps younger children is that i know what to expect i know when i do my homework i know what the routine is for getting out of out of, uh, out of the house in the morning if it's if the kids don't have that what they tend to do is test they tend to push and, and it, it's not because they're misbehaving it's because they're trying to get some structure they're trying to find out what the rules are. And so, so you, it's important for the parents to step up. If they're going to come into family therapy with you, then are you helping the parents get on the same page about their value system or their discipline style? And then yeah. how to convey a team approach right. so that the Absolutely. child is like, this is consistent. Absolutely. Yeah, they need to have that team approach. You know, this is the classic, you don't, you know, you know, disagree with your partner in front of the kids because then you're kind of undermining them and all that kind of stuff. You may disagree, but you need to work out a system and you need to have teamwork considering, you know, just our hectic lives just to back each other up. You know, if you've had a hard day at work, you know, you're going to text your partner at four o'clock and kind of go, I need some help tonight, <laughs> you know, if you can get the kids in bed, because I am wiped out, you know, or, you know, if you're starting to get irritable and you're getting into an argument with your kid, you know, you want a tag team, <laughs> you gotta go, you know, I got to go cool off. If you can take over, that'd be great. You, you need that kind of support. So you when, know? when a parent team doesn't view parenting the same way, how would you help them? What would be the approach that they could expect when they came to family therapy? 
Well, I, I would be talking about that pretty clearly. You know, I'm going to be talking about how it's confusing for your kids to have different sets of rules. I'm going to be talking about you're setting things up for one parent to be the bad guy and the other one the good guy. Mm -hmm. And that's not fair for the kids and it's not fair for, for the parent. You know, you don't want to be the heavy disciplinaire. You know, this is the, the polarized family, which is one of the worst case scenarios. I'm easy because you're tough. I'm tough because you're easy. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have that. You know, yeah. we need to kind of meet in the middle because the one that's always tough is going to be seen as the bad guy, mm. you know, and their kids are, are going to get this one dimensional view of mom or dad and never really get a close connection. So we got to be, you know, we need to change that. And so I'm I'm going to be real clear about, it. you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to be clear. I think this is really important. You guys need to work together as a team. It's confusing for your kids. You know, part of part of the problems they're having is the fact that they're you guys are on different pages. You know, and I'm like, I'm not even going to I'm not going to tell them what kind of page they got to get on. Right. My job is to facilitate and help them carve it out themselves, you know, agree on some bottom lines. What time is the kid going to go to bed? What? How do we feel about homework? You know, whatever it is. Can we come up with some basic stuff? Do you find that couples are often not clear on what their value system is or what their parenting style is before they have kids? And how do you help them then sort of like back, work backwards to create yeah. that? Yeah, I think, I mean, for some folks, that's absolutely true. Um, I, you, you cannot not have a parenting system. You just may not be conscious and planful about it. You know, what, what happened, you know, we, you know, I, one of the things I say to parents is we, you all walk out, of, everybody walks out of their childhood with a certain impression of your childhood, of the way your parents were about, even about marriage, you know, and f from your little kid brain, you know, when you're walking out, you tend to think in terms of black and white, you know, if my parents had seemed to have a great marriage, I want to have one like that. And then you emulate that and you kind of do what they do. You know, if my parents had, a, you know, didn't do a good job or they weren't good parents, they were neglectful or too abusive, I'm not going to do that. And the danger here is you kind of swing too far to the other side, you know? So if you have what seemed like an abusive kind of parent, you could be too lenient, you know, and you're not setting enough structure and the kids are running all over you by the time they're 14 years old, you know? but and so, so you want to be able to, and you're going to get triggered by your own stuff. Mm. You know, if, you know, if you had a critical dad, you might be super sensitive to any kind of criticism and then that makes you get, get derailed. So yeah, you want to have, you want to have those kind of conversations. And most, you know, I think most couples do, they start talking about parenting when they're pregnant, you know, mm -hmm. or they, even before they get married, you know, are they going to be different? You know, are they going to come from different backgrounds? Are they going to have different triggers? Are they going to be sensitive to some things more than others? Sure. Mm -hmm. Ideally, they, you know, they have an opportunity to kind of work that out. What I see a lot, you know, again, given our age, in terms of just the nature of our society, is one of the concerns I have is that families are just, they're complaining that, you know, we're passing in the night. You know, mm -hmm. we are, you know, we got ballet lessons and soccer games and I'm working late at work and we got this and we got that. And the couple suffers because they don't have time as a couple. Mm -hmm. You know, all we're doing is mom and pop and we get the kids in bed by nine o'clock and then we, we're just we're just crashed. You know? <laughs> you know, we're watching we're watching Netflix and zoning out. We're looking at our phone, but they never have time for intimacy. They never have time for conversations. They never talk about parenting. You know, how are we doing or what we're worried about until things blow up? But it also happens for families in general. You know, I've met families and you probably have too, where, you know, they don't even eat dinner together. You know, maybe that's old school, but, you know, somebody's got to run off to a softball game and the other kids come in late and they never kind of sit down and they never have conversations and they're kind of, everybody's kind of catch as catch can. You know, you know, I tend to be kind of clear about that too. You know, if they're complaining that we don't have time as a couple, 
you know, or we're we're worn out, you know, sometimes it's because they don't have options. You know, if, if you have to work two jobs, you're going to be working two jobs. And I understand that, you know, and you do the best you can. But for a lot of couples, it's about, you know, a lot of families to go on an autopilot. Mm, okay. You know, you're, you're busy because you're volunteering for too much stuff, you know, or, you know, you're not getting the kids to bed at nine o'clock. They're staying up till 11 o'clock. And probably they need to go to bed earlier, but you're not enforcing any kind of enough structure, you know, so you don't have time. And so I'm going to I'm going to challenge them to go, you, you know, periodically you want to step back and look at your lifestyle. You're there. You have the ability to make decisions. You have mm-hmm. the ability to have choices. You have the ability to change what you're doing. Oftentimes, again, if you're working two jobs, maybe not. But if your kids are going to 87, you know, soccer games a week and you have no time as a family on the weekend, you can change that, you know, but it's again, we don't. It's kind of like the values. We just got to do what we do because we do it. Do you think that part of that is because there is a a kind of a popular belief that we sometimes are too much friends with our children? And that's kind of like a major shift is if we're treating our children like they're our friends, then of course their activities take a priority and we don't feel like we have the opportunity to say, cut that back because that would be disrespecting our friend. Like tell me about your, your, your perspective. Yeah. I mean, what, one of, you know, what I was saying before, you know, one of the worst case scenarios is we have parents are polarized where one's hard and one's easy. The more even worser, that's a word situation is where the kids are running the show yeah you know where the parents are it, i i worked you know for 30 years in community mental health and we would get a lot of referrals for kids who are in trouble with the courts or with school or, or whatever and you, you know my takeaway was that in most cases the problem wasn't that the parents were um too strict i mean you have cases where parents are abusive but usually it was they weren't structured enough. You know, there wasn't a structure. And either, you know, there was this kind of treating your kid like a friend mm-hmm. or they're afraid of conflict and they didn't want to stir the pot or they're afraid to put their foot down. Or again, the parents were on different pages and the kids were squeezing through the cracks. And yeah, yeah I think, you know, the, the, again, the old school structural family therapy idea is you need to have a hierarchy. You know, you're not going to treat your 15 year old the same way as you treat your eight year old but you don't want your 15 year old to act like they're 25 mm-hmm. you know when they start doing that and they start to feel entitled and i can kind of do what i want and the parents are afraid to put their foot down or to set structure or to set limits that's not good for the kid you know it's and again this is where it gets into the family right. dynamics you know how where do I- you where do you think that fear is coming from because that sounds very much what i see with clients and i'm curious from your perspective what's driving that fear of me having conflict with the child or me putting my foot down and letting my children know what's acceptable and what's not acceptable what what would be driving that in a general sense well again i think sometimes it's, it's what we were saying before you know you come out of your childhood if you had if you grew up in a family where everybody's fighting all the time, you know, your memories of that are, you know, that kind of harsh, critical environment and everybody's yelling and screaming, you, you overshift. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to turn into my mom or dad. And so I swing too far the other way and I'm not structured. And it's and there's a difference between, you know, being militant and, and you, you know, power hungry and, just setting up structure yeah. you know you don't have to scream and yell at your kids you know but you do want to set limits on things you know you want to let them know what's appropriate what's not appropriate you want to have you know family rules about how you treat each other mm-hmm. you know and if a kid feels entitled and they kind of do what they want you know they, they become a, a runaway train and you know and and i think that causes real problems later on in life you know they're going to have that same attitude they're going to become self-centered you don't want that so how would you work with the middle ground how would you work with a family where because that sounds very much like what we see in our offices quite a bit right one parent has 
been overwhelmed, they're resorting to yelling and screaming, they don't want to do it. They're, it's not in alignment with their character or how they aspire to be, yet the, the train has gotten off course. How right. would going to family therapy, what kind of tools or what would you be pointing out to help them make that change? Yeah, well, it's, it's it, you know, to rehash what I was saying before, you know, if the parents are on the same page, we need to help them see that that's important to do. We need to work together as a team, you know, cover each other's back, come up with the same rules and regulations. And, you know, I can help them do that. And when they get stuck, we'll talk about why they get stuck. You know, if it's about, if it's about skill sets, they don't know how to handle a 14 year old compared to an eight year old. We got to talk about that. You know, you don't have to scream and yell. You don't got to pick them up and put it in your room. You don't have to call the cops. Here's other ways of kind of handling it. You know, you're going to treat your ch children differently. You know, it's not one size fits all. You know, you have to consider your child's temperament. You got to consider your child's age, all that kind of stuff. You know, and again, it depends on the age. You, you know, if, you know, if, if you have a 14-year-old or a 16-year-old in family therapy, they can speak for themselves. Mm. You know, they can participate now if they can then you, they need support you, you know but i but they can they can engage in a conversation you can come up with compromises where it's not the parents caving in but the, the, the child feels hurt mm. you know i okay i'm, I'm not going to come home at midnight but I'll, i will come home at 11 and if i'm running late i'll call you up whatever it is you know let's let's kind of you know you want to reward good thinking and cooperation uh, you know, if a child is eight years old, you know, you, you're not going to, you may not have those kind of conversations, but even then you may, you know, I've done family therapy and we do family drawings or we have the parents sit in on a play therapy session. So they get to understand their child better and understand what, what motivates them and understand where their behaviors come from. You know, and oftentimes, again, it's about skill set. You know, here's things you can do instead of yelling and screaming. You know, you can use a timeout. Here's how you can give them a warning. Here's how you can, you know, follow up. You know, one of the characteristics of families that are no different than couples, you know, when I see couples and you see couples, is a lot of times they make up, but they don't go back and mm. solve a problem. We uh, get a temporary, like, truce, and then we yeah. don't ever talk about it again. We never talk about it again. And so it's just a matter of time before the problem comes up again. And so... You know, I'm always talking to families and couples about, okay, there's the first aid part of a situation. You know, when things are getting too hot and heavy and people are arguing, that's about lowering the temperature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need to have skills and realize when that's happening. That is not a time to solve the problem because you don't got a brain. Your brain's offline. And, but at some point you want to come back. And it's not just make up and go, I'm sorry about last night, you know, if, you know, you don't want to get into a raging argument with your nine-year-old about homework, but at some point you want to have a calm conversation about homework, you know, and come up with a plan that they both, you both can agree on, you know, and you, and you're going to teach the parent to use more carrots than sticks and you're going to reward behaviors and fine tune the plan. And again, you know, I think that's, that's where it, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of any other you know, if you go to a doctor for a problem, their job is to give you advice about do something different, you know, about your lifestyle or whatever, if you don't want to have problems. And that's their expertise. And this is what family therapy can do. You know, they can offer you that as well as a safe place to talk it through. Right. Where they, everybody can feel like they're seen and heard and someone's managing yeah. the temperature in the room. Absolutely. Which I think is a good segue to something I wanna make sure that I ask you about because a lot of what I see in my office is when we have blended families, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a new step parent involved, maybe the biological parent is still involved. And right. this idea of what sort of involvement does a step parent have in disciplining or deciding yeah. the value system of how we're gonna raise the child. And that creates a lot of conflict, misunderstanding Absolutely. and hurt feelings. Can you talk about that dilemma? Yeah. Sure, this is, this is um, probably not the right word, but this is a classic common problem. And the classic common problem, again, when I was working in community mental health, it would be a situation, one of the common things we would see is there would be, you know, a mom who had 
a couple of kids or a few kids. And um, and then they would get divorced or the parent would leave or they would die or something, the other parent. And so the mom becomes a single mom or a single dad, doesn't matter. Um, and then they're kind of, uh, and what happens oftentimes for a lot of good reasons is if you have a single parent, you know, the structure may be a little bit looser. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the older kids are going to be helping out with the younger kids. They kind of fill in. There's, you know, different style. And so that would go on for a few years. And then the parent would get remarried or they have a new partner or girlfriend or somebody. And they would kind of show up in the family and they got to go, these kids are walking all over you. What are you they're staying up till 10 30 at night? We don't have any time as a couple. They need you need to get these kids in line. And the the mistake here, or the what you don't want to do thing is this is where the step parent starts going, okay, kids, you time you gotta go to bed now. And what invariably happens is now the oldest kid in the family goes, you ain't my daddy, mm. you know, and they start butting heads around this kind of stuff. And the challenge here is, you know, and the rule of thumb is, you know, it may be true that they need to have more structure or as a couple, they need to kind of change the rules of engagement. So they do have time as a couple and the kids aren't staying up till 11 o'clock at night, but the step parent doesn't, you don't want the step parent to be the heavy because they don't have a relationship with the kids. Yeah. So the rule of thumb is, you know, if you want, you know, if you want to change some of the rules and some of the whatever, they can support the natural parent in doing that. You know, they kind of go, okay, it's hard. You know, I kind of, I struggle to kind of do that. You don't need to say anything. Just come stand next to me when I tell the kids it's time to go to bed at 10 o'clock. And the step parent needs to spend time building a relationship. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go fishing with the son. I'm going to go, you know, take take the kids to the soccer game, whatever. I, I got to low key it for a while until I kind of build up some credibility and some kind of a relationship. Yeah. Once I do that, then maybe I'll begin to step in. You know? As I call it, you, you're a best friend and a confidant, but they have a parent. Right or right. parents, right? That are already been doing this for a while. And right. that's how you best build a relationship. Right. Yeah. And so, and, and, you know, and, and the natural transition to a step parent, you know, if you have more than one child, often one child is more loyal to the other ex parent, you know, and they have a hard time with the step parents. So you have to work harder to kind of build that relationship. You know, there's always the challenge, you know, I'm always saying to the parents who, who get divorced, I said, you know, what's one of, if you have kids and you're divorced, one of your challenges, you got to do everything now that you couldn't do when you were married. Mm. You need to communicate, you need to cooperate, you need to kind of be, get on the same page. All the stuff that you probably struggled with, now you're going to be doing it for the next 10 years or the next day, whatever it is. And, you know, and that's important. You know, everybody's going to be on the same page, you know. Fortunately, oftentimes it's not. You know, the kids go to stay with mom or dad for a weekend and they come back a mess because they've been staying up till midnight playing video games, you know, and and they're still battling as even though they're divorced, they're still battling as parents. It's not good for the kids. Or worse sometimes and not intentionally, but maybe mom has partnered up with their child and like sort of let them take the role of their partner for a while. And then that person, when you get a true partner gets displaced and they right. don't know what their role is anymore. And that's going to create conflict in the system. Right. And that's, and that's what happens again, classically it's, you know, the older child has kind of taken on a junior parent surrogate kind of role and all of a sudden they get bumped, mm -hmm. you know, and as soon as you start changing the family structure, it, People get anxious and angry and whatever, but yeah, now, now they start challenging them, you know, and, and so it's about how do, how do we give this child another job? How do we help them feel, you know, be part of the family and, and not have to worry about mom or, or feeling like they're losing power. And that's, yeah. And that's one of the challenges, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Or, you know, or again, the child acts out 
and you know becomes a vicarious outlet for the parent you know you go tell your stepdad how you feel fight my battles yeah. So if someone's listening to this and they're like, everything that Robert says sounds like we should be going to family therapy, what should they look for in a good family therapist? What what would make somebody a good fit? Um, I, I, again, you, you know, I'm always saying you, you cannot not have expectations about going to therapy. You know, even if you're watching Dr. Phil or hearing stories from your friends, you probably have some kind of expectation, you know, so kind of figure that out, you know, what, what are you, what are you looking for most? What is it you'd like to get out of it most? Mm. You know, is it, we're not, we're struggling as parents because we're young parents and so we need help with parenting or no, we need, you know, we need somebody to help to back us up and dealing with teenagers who feel like they're out of control or we need someone who knows something about eating disorders because our daughter is struggling with anorexia and we don't know how to help you know, kind of figure out what's on top of your list. What's your priority? You know, again, fortunately now you can, you don't have to go ask around whispered friends about how do you find somebody? You can go online. You could look at profiles. You could look at therapist directories, but then, and then look for people who, who kind of fit what you're looking for. I tell people, go, go ahead and do a five minute interview, you know, call them up or say, you know, can I just chat with you for five minutes? I don't want to do a session on the phone. But I just got a couple of questions. You know, what's your style? Most people have a website now. They describe their style. They'll tell you what they do, what they don't do. You can you can hand pick what popular, you know, what kind of problem areas you want help with. You know, is it is the difference between my baby that's not sleeping compared to my 15 year old who I think is smoking too much pot? You know, so you, you can you can do that. And then go in and be clear, you know. Uh, you know, I'm always telling students, you, you know, you want to check in with families after a session or two to make sure everybody's on the same page, you know, and making sure they're getting what, what they want. And, you, you know, a lot of times families are not happy with what's going on and then they just drop away and you don't know. And, uh, you know, so to be able as a as a family, be able to advocate for what you want. You know, if you feel like the therapist isn't giving you enough information or they're not understanding a certain problem that you're trying to help them understand, speak up. Yes. You know? Again, you're a consumer. Yeah. You know, I'm, and you're a big, you know, I'm a big fan. You, you're you paying for this. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, perform, you know, and kind of get what you need. Don't just take what you get and then kind of drop away. Because if you're feeling like the therapist is only choosing one family member and, and actually doing that triangulation that we talked about, like making it not understanding the system and how we all contribute it, you as your own advocate should be standing up and asking for your needs and remembering this is not about our ego. This is about this family having a good experience of therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you and, and, and again, hopefully you would do it with like your family doctor, you know, if, you know, if they're describing some kind of radical treatment that you're not ready to handle, you speak up and say, do we really need to do this? Or I'm going to go get a second opinion. Right. Yeah. And you want to be able to do the same thing. Thank you for that. I think it's important for those of us that are, are actually therapists to be aware of that power differential that you, we have and that we can be intimidating because we're in this power position and you normalizing, hey, this is not about us knowing all it's about your experience and what you actually need from us i think is really important for for all of our clients to hear yeah yeah and and and, and again you're going to have therapists who have different styles different perspectives you know what I, i'll i try to be as clear as possible even in a first session about here's what i think you know we, we need to focus on and i'm going to say does this make sense to you if, if you need to think about it, go think about it, get other options, you know, you know, get other perspectives. I don't want you to, again, feel like you're trapped and you got to take what you get. But I also want to I want to work together as a team. My job is to help you help help your family and solve your own problems. You know, and if you're not agreeing or you don't understand why I'm suggesting X, Y, Z. OK, you know, find somebody else who fits fits that better, you know, or speak up to me. And we'll see if we can change it. Great. 
Yep. Any last tips for someone that's on the fence about how to ask their other family members to attend family therapy with them? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I always say say to folks, um, because what, what, what family members get worried about is I'm going to get trapped in family therapy, never come out. Or I'm going to be put on the spot and I'm going to have to divulge some big secret or it's going to be whatever. And, you know, part of part of my job as a therapist is to be sensitive to to each individual and be able to kind of accommodate that. You know, if I'm seeing a 15 year old, I know I got to not sound like their parents. You know, I got to be the unparent <laughs> because they're going to be hyper. You know, it's going to be like three three adults coming at me, not, not just two. And so uh, that's my job. But what I, what I say to folks is, you know, for example, if you want to bring in your teenager or bring in the whole family, say, you know, I'd like you to come in, you know, you know, you've been having these arguments or problems about this. I just want to have a safe place for us to talk, for me to get some things off my chest. You don't have to talk. We're only going to go one time, you know, but I just want to have, a forum for you to understand better why I'm worried and concerned. So they don't feel pressured. To, and then it's my job to help Bring them, them in, convince them. And see if they want to come back, you know, that that's not, and get them to talk if they, if they can, but just keep it, keep minimal kind of expectations. So they're not Beautiful. feeling cold. And, yeah. Thank you for that. Cause I think that there's a lot of, listeners that are like, yeah, we really need to do this. I don't know how to approach it. I'm worried we're going to be there forever. I'm worried my fam my kid's not going to resonate with the therapist and or we're not really going to get anything resolved. So I think that you've done a lot to kind of reassure what it looks like to have a supportive person that you're you're not invested in the outcome unless it's the outcome that the family wants. So I really appreciate you bringing your wisdom and you're very approachable. So I, I'm sure that anybody who listens to this will be like, oh gosh, I'm not so nervous about family therapy. Thank you, Robert. So <laughs> how can people find you if they wanna learn more about your writings and your books and how to connect with you? So, so I have a website and you're welcome to look at it. It's my name, it's Bob Tabby, T -A -I -B -B -I com. I also have a blog on psychology today. It's got about 500 articles. I'm it's doing great, it yes. And it has a lot of, you know, family issues, couple issues, anxiety, depression. They're short, very concrete with, with advice and specifics. You can just kind of scroll through it and, and take a look. And, we will we'll and definitely I have, put I have an offer page on Amazon. You can look up my books. Great. Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate your wisdom and your time. I know how busy you are and, and this has been impactful. So thanks for all you do. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into the D-Spot. Find me, Dr. Dana McNeil, and my guests on social media using the links down below. Subscribe for new episodes weekly and leave a comment letting us know how and if you can relate or what topics you'd like us to cover next. See you next time. And don't forget, going to therapy is cool.